got that right here. It's called the Tests of Leadership. And um, get into um, all sorts of different things. We talked about it last class where we were talking about uh, preparation. Remember, we talked about Joshua being prepared by Moses and, and all of the ministry that went into that and um, all of his preparation before the Lord. Um, it's, it seems that all of the, the men who became great leaders for the Lord, all of them went to the same Bible school. The Wilderness School of the Bible. Amen? Remember that one? Israel was in the wilderness. Abraham went down into the wilderness. Moses was in the wilderness. Jesus was taken out into the wilderness. David went into the wilderness. There's a lot of training that goes on in, in the wilderness. Uh, it's not a fun place. You know, we say, oh, I want to go to the Wilderness School of the Bible. Well, some of you are in it. <laughs> you just don't recognize it. You think it's this place, but it's not. God has you kind of out there in the wilderness looking around going, what is going on? Well, I thought this was going to be fun. And well, where's all of this and that? And you, know, and, and you look at Moses. I mean, he thought he was going to deliver Israel right out of all of their troubles, and he was going to be this great man of God. And the first thing God did to him was take him out into the wilderness school of the Bible. And that school for, for him was 40 years long. He was 40 years old when he enrolled. Amen. Yeah, 40 years. He started his ministry, and this is what freaks us out. He started his ministry when he was 80. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, am I going to live to be 80? You know? I mean, that's when he started his ministry. I mean, now that, that just freaks us all out. We're going, what are you talking about? Preparation. Preparation. Well, you know, preparation, 40 years, you know? <clears throat> Not counting everything that went before that. <clears throat> and so God is, God, you know, he's, he's not tied down by time restraints. He's eternal. As far as the way that he lives and functions, he doesn't think in terms of time. He invented it. <laughs> he's not caught up in it. He's not going, oh, you know, here's, here's us. Remember we were talking about this uh, last time that I shared. I was talking about how, you know, when I was uh, 16, 17, I said, this is, this is how my life's going to go. By the time that I'm 18, I will uh, have a really good job, should have bought my own car, pretty soon have my own stereo, have my own furniture, da 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 and pretty soon be paying for my own house before I get married, so that da da da, -da this big plan, you know, and it's all timed out in increments of two years, you know? <laughs> and this will happen, and then this, and then this, and then, then of course, your life will be wonderful. <clears throat> well, God's funny. He doesn't always look at what we're thinking when we're 16 and go, okay, I'm going to work it out that way for you. <laughs> you know? A lot of times, it's, uh, I brought you into existence because I have something in my mind. And you will never truly be happy until you find out why you're even here. <laughs> you know, and so we sit there and try to get God to bless what we want and da da da, da. And, and I believe that God puts things on our heart. And I believe that uh, he fulfills the things that he puts on our heart. But never mistake uh, what we want as what he wants. And again, the, the example of these men, I mean, you look at David. David was a man who was being prepared... And uh, uh, the, the prophet came and laid hands on him and poured oil on him and said, you are the king of Israel. I'm the king of the world. You know, 17 year old kid, you know, <laughs> thinking this is it, yeah, I'm the king, you know. And then what happens? Well, you know, things start getting a little bit better after that and he ends up killing Goliath. And he ends up doing some great things for the king. And this looks like this is pretty good. You know? And then all of a sudden it all spirals out of control as he has to run away, fear for his life. Um, what's worse is instead of all of the reputable people of Israel joining to David, all the outcasts and people that owed money and all this stuff, they're the ones who came to join. So that it just added to his picture that he was some sort of a renegade. You know, and so, but what did David do? He let the Lord prepare him 
And even that preparation took, took place in forms of increments. He was a leader over the outcasts. Then he was a leader over uh, Judah and Benjamin. Then he was a leader over, over all Israel. <coughs> and you see that in the progression. There were three anointings of David. Three anointings. And it was, God, just anoint me, you know? And so, you know, he anoints you, you know, just enough to be over the renegades and the outcasts. <clears throat> so, the scripture here that I have in mind is John 13, 7. Jesus answered and said unto, unto him, What I do, uh, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. So here's Jesus talking to the people who are supposedly in the know, the only ones that are on the planet that really should know what's going on. And Jesus says to them, What I do, you don't really know. <laughs> And uh, there's another one just a few chapters over, chapter 16 and verse 12. <clears throat> In one sense, it gets worse. He says, I have many things. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them. <laughs> you, know, you know, the word bear, do you understand the word bear? You cannot bear them. You know, I have many things to say to you. Many things to say to you. Jesus has many things to say to me. Well, you can't bear them. You shall. You can't handle the truth. Uh, no, it's a little more than that. You can't bear it. You can't bear it. Why? A lot of it has to do with our preconceived ideas. Well, God's going to make me a leader. God's going to use me. God's going to make me a minister. God's going to do whatever it is on, on that form. Um, and that usually has to do with a pure heart. There is something within us that is called, that is, that is uh, uh, drawn of God, that is called of God. But never, you know, the, but when you're young, you go, man, you know, you jump up and you want to be called of God. And God has a basic slogan. And he's the one that calls you, okay? So it's, don't call me, I'll call you. Because <laughs> 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 it's his calling, man. It's his calling, not your calling. <laughs> so, so here's, you know, here's our ambition rising up. Here's our desire. Here's our thing. And, and again, that's not usually coming from some sort of wicked place. A lot of times that's coming from a desire for the Lord, for the body of Christ, for the glory of God, to see something happen on and on and on and on. I mean, things that count, things that are important. Now, I don't put that down, and I don't believe the Lord puts it down. But I think that the Lord does view it in a whole different light, and that is, look, you know, we're talking about this stuff. Of, I have many things to say to you, but you just can't even bear it at this point. The neat thing is, and we'll get into this later, the, 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 I mean, imagine, imagine you being one of the twelve. You have followed him for three and a half years. You have heard things nobody else has heard. You've seen things nobody else has heard. You have experienced things. You have experienced the Lord. I mean, you're not experiencing religion. You're not just in some church group or synagogue or whatever like that. I mean, you are following the Son of God, the manifest one. Nobody else has known this one like you twelve have known. And he turns to you and says, toward almost the very end of his ministry, he turns to you and says, I have so much to tell you, but you really can't handle it right now. And you're thinking, <clears throat> you know, we know so much. And never think that you know so much. Okay, that's the first mistake. I mean, there's so much of Jesus that... and. I don't know if we'll get into it. Hopefully we'll get into it. But, um, but, but that's why you never lose your desire for Jesus. You never, ever, ever lose a hunger to see the Lord, to know the Lord, to be with the Lord, to walk in, you know, in that union with the Lord. You never, ever lose that. You'll, you'll, regardless of how He uses you, you'll always be a disciple, which means a learner. Because there's so, so, so much of this glorious Lord. And it's a and it, what it does is it keeps you tender and it keeps you hungry and it keeps you down and it keeps you needy. And it's to the needy that he came. You know. When you start getting all having it together and knowing everything and everything, that's that's when trouble comes. You know, because then he says, Well, I came for the sick and you're not sick, you're just fine. I came for the hungry and you you seem pretty satisfied. And then the 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 
thing gets turned off, the flow gets turned off, and we don't even know it for a while. Remember what it says of uh, Samson? That the Lord was no longer with him and he didn't even know it. Is that scary to anybody? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you know, I don't want to get so far from the Lord that I don't even know that the Lord isn't with me. And so, <clears throat> Jesus says to him, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear it now. Thank God for the next verse. Nevertheless, when He, the Spirit of the truth, the Spirit of truth comes, glory to God, Glory to God. Jesus, the greatest teacher ever walked the earth, says, look, i got to go away. But I'm going to send another teacher. Now, they haven't. They don't know nothing about this spirit of truth guy. They're going, why are you going away? Well, I don't want you to go away. And every one of us experienced this, folks. I don't want you. I want to feel you. I want to touch you. I want to have you in, in, in all of the ways that we had you in the early going. This becomes a, a form of deception, not that it's meant to be, but it is. We think that what God intends for us is what God gives us in the early going, which is complete joy, complete peace, complete happiness, complete, you know, freedom. I mean, some of you have experienced the Lord in ways that you just have just danced before the Lord, just going, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And it's gone. There's nothing like being just free. And I mean, they just, ah! Oh. But then there comes a day when the Lord begins to restrict you, like the Apostle Paul. You begin to put in, be put in prison, as it were. Not, there are a lot of prisons, man. Right? <laughs> not just physical prison. You, you're restricted, and you're held back, and everything, and all the things that you had planned, and you begin to think you failed, or you are, you know, you might even think God failed you, or whatever else. And all He's doing is developing you still. Because anybody can, can sit on a top of a white charger with people behind them and say, let's go! You know? But not anybody can sit in prison, can sit in whatever, not again, a lot of different prisons, and say, Jesus, I love you with all of my being. I don't have to have everything happening. I don't have to have proofs in the flesh and the outward. You, I'm glad you went away so that the spirit of truth has come to me and he speaks on levels I never could have heard before. In other words, you are saying many things to me that you couldn't have said before. Amen? Amen. It's a blessing. It's a blessing, but in the initial stages in that wilderness school of the Bible, it doesn't feel like a blessing. I mean, you know, Jesus steps out, steps down into the Jordan, dove descends like the Holy Spirit, like a dove. Heaven opens up. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You know, yeah! I'm a Son of God! And then all of a sudden, Yanks you out of there, takes you out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. You do without any food, whatever, under constant temptation by the devil. I thought you said I was the Son of God. I thought you'd done great things. I thought the heavens were open. This, this is dry. This is so lacking. You trim back everything. Mm. Everything but the real. That's right. And that's when you really find out what you have and what's truly real. It's the only way. You can't, you can't get it. We've talked about this last class. You can't get that sitting here in the classroom. I mean, I can teach you. I can say words. We can have all these different teachers come in here and say stuff. And it's not going to mean anything. The goal on your part is to hear these things. And like Jesus said at one point, let these things sink down into you. And go, yes, I don't want to just hear, because I mean, you can, you can just come and sit and go and come and sit and go and just hear a lot of stuff. But when you come, you're not going to grasp everything any one teacher says. There's no way. But what you can do 
is just say, Lord, I am your child, I am your son, and I, by the Holy Spirit, ask you to let these things sink down in me and become part of me and bring them up and work them in me and, and bring it forth at the right time so that it'll mean something. So that, it, so that it'll mean life and it'll it'll come forth in fruitfulness instead of just hearing and you know thinking I got something. Gosh, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, a hunger for the Lord will keep you from doing that. Because you you will be learning him, and they were learning him, but at the same moment you you say more of Jesus. Listen to me. More of Jesus. He must increase. And so there becomes an openness on a level that you can't describe. But it just it's just crying out. It's just a constant cry for the Lord. For the Lord. Nobody can put that in you. You just got to love the Lord. You just got to have a desire. And if you don't have the desire, I'd say, man, especially if you're here in Bible school, I'd think, there's, what else you got to do with your time? And get out on your knees and cry out and say, God, break through. I mean, you can be just a regular Christian. We got lots of them. Yeah? I mean, we just got. Or you can draw near to Him and have Him transform you to such a degree that He makes the difference. Amen? And that's the deal. And we've been blessed in this place to be able to have some time to set aside and be able to do that. Don't let it slip away. <clears throat> you know, the biggest. The biggest problem I had with that headache that I had when I woke up this morning was that a whole day slipped by and I was unable to really spend it with the Lord. I hate the loss of time. Redeem the time. Amen? That's what the Word of God says. Redeem it. Don't let it slip away. Don't think I've got my whole life in front of me. Man, take the time. Get hold of that time. You control the time. And most people don't. They let time control them. Well, I've got this, and I've got to do this, and I've got that, and I've got that. You know, we say, you know, I remember when I was in Bible school, somebody said, I just don't have enough time. And he looked at me like I did. And I thought, you know, all of us have the same amount of time. We all get 24 hours in a day. <laughs> you, know, you got more time than I do. No, I don't. I don't have 28 hours, and you got 24. <laughs> You know, that's crazy. You've got the same amount. But you have to redeem it. And you know what? If you're faithful with least, what will God do for you? Gives you more. But you've got to be faithful. With those moments, those few moments, when they're spent in love and adoration, I mean, just, just appreciation. Oh, God, thank you just for this little bit. This was just wonderful out of my day. He looks and he goes, well, I'm going to bless you more. You know? But if we go... <coughs> Dang, I just got started. You give me three minutes, Lord. What's the deal? <laughs> you know? That's where the Jews got that stuff. Wow. <laughs> anyway. All right. So, basically, Jesus is, is saying that there needs to be, that, that I've taught you a lot of stuff, but your preparation isn't over time. And preparation is a big deal. Would you say that? I mean, it's a it's a huge deal. Um, you know, it wasn't raining when Noah entered into the ark, or when, or when he started to build it. It wasn't raining when he started to build it. Goes, oh my God, I better prepare. <laughs> you know, so well, a little late now, there, buddy boy. You know, you should have had this thing up and running. Well, but I didn't see any rain. Well, you know, you're supposed to prepare for the rain, not in the rain. <laughs> and that's the problem. Most of us are, we're wanting to prepare all right, but we're waiting for some sign. We're waiting for something to motivate us out here, out here. Something to happen out here, the rain or, 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 you know, people start walking around with signs saying the end of the world is, you know, three weeks and, you know, 27 seconds from now, you know. And then go, oh, oh, you know. And that's what most people are doing. I mean, that's what they're motivated on. Man, Jesus said, look, I've got to go away so he, the spirit of truth, will come and he's going to impart stuff. He will speak of me. He will, he will prepare you in ways that I could never prepare you standing right here. Because as long as you can touch me and, you know, hear my comforting words and, you know, you know, lay down at night and go, oh, no word. And Jesus goes, it's okay, it's going to be okay. 
Oh, I'm going to snuggle up to Jesus. And, oh, it's just Jesus and us twin. Well, one of you is a murderer, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah, who is it? You know, and that's what they did. So they don't know. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know what's going on. But the spirit of truth knows what's going on. And so the preparation is, <clears throat> is getting under the leading of the spirit of truth and, and giving that time, redeeming that time. Uh, most of you are familiar with uh, Galatians. Let's turn there. Galatians, the first chapter. And see, I think that, that we're not going to be any kind of a leader unless we do this kind of stuff now. You know what I mean? I mean, we've got to do this stuff now. We've got to, you know, the, the story that I tell is, you know, the missionary, you know, uh, he says, well, you know, I want to go to the missionary, I want to go to the mission field, I want to be a missionary. And so, <clears throat> but he never witnesses. He never, you know, he, he spends all of his time doing his own thing, watching TV and doing all this kind of stuff. And so when the time comes to go, he gets on the airplane and he thinks somehow that the airplane is going to transform him. And the airplane doesn't transform you into a missionary. You're either a missionary or you're not. You see what I'm saying? I mean, we're, we're waiting for the, you know, drop me in the middle of a foreign country and I will be a missionary. No, 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 no. You'll be exactly what you are here. You know. So the work of God is now, not someday. Amen? The work of God is right now. It's an ongoing work. It doesn't have to be a big flashy work, but it does have to be ongoing. <laughs> Just a regular, or keep on going, keep on going, one foot in front of the other type ministry carried out. Uh, Galatians chapter 1 and verse uh, 15 and 16. Well, let's go through 17. Begin in verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, that I went into <coughs> Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. And so here is this situation. You've got several things happening here. Number one, when God called Paul, the first action that took place was a new birth. He was separated from his first birth. Amen? He was separated from his first birth. He was no longer Saul, the whiz-bang, up-and-coming Pharisee. He was no longer Saul of Tarsus. Oh, Saul of Tarsus. I've heard about him. He was more zealous than all of his brethren. Oh, Saul of Tarsus. He was one of the sharpest kids in the class. Hello. You know, if that's the only testimony we got, <laughs> we ain't got one of the sharpest kids in the class. You know, I'd rather somebody say, man, I see Jesus. You know. And you know what? By being the sharpest kid in the class, weaker ones, you know what they'll do? They'll start comparing. And comparing is not good. Because you're going to start saying, well, look at them. They're this and that. And I'm this and that. And what are you doing? You're comparing uh, first birth uh, comparisons on that level. You're not comparing in Christ because all have the life of Christ. All have the same grace. All have the same fullness, which is Christ. Amen? Amen? I mean, the true value of this thing is the treasure, which is Christ. But we get into comparing and we think, well, look at that person. And when we say, look at that person, then what do we automatically do? We look at us and we begin to compare. And I tell you what, man, if you ain't looking at Jesus in them, then the fault's yours. And if you ain't looking at Jesus in you and trusting in, in the life of Christ within you, then you're looking in the wrong place and the fault is yours. You know, the scriptures are clear. Don't compare yourselves among yourselves. Do not compare. Do not compare. Over and over and over. Don't compare yourself with anybody else here. Be who you are and seek the Lord with all your heart. As much as you can. As much as in you is, you seek the Lord. But, you know, when you start looking at other people. Now, I, I, one of the things.
things that did motivate me was I would look and see Jesus in somebody else and I'd get jealous. They would provoke me to jealousy. And I'd go, mm, I want Jesus like that. But I didn't go, well, I can't have Jesus like that because they're special and I'm a dork. And dorks never get the Lord like that. You know, I didn't go through that. You know why? Because I was never a dork. No, not really. <laughs> no, the, the reason why, compared to Christ, we're all dorks. Amen? <laughs> but I mean, you know, I didn't look at them and go, I can't, I just didn't. No, no, I look at them and go, man, they've got the... They've got Jesus in this way. And what would come to my mind is God is no respecter of persons. That's one thing that would always come to my mind. Always. Why? It's the Word of God. That's what should come to our mind is the Word of God. Amen? And that's what ought to rule our thoughts. Cast down everything else and let the Word of God rule. The knowledge of God. Don't let it cast down the knowledge of God. Shame on you. But, but what does the knowledge of the Lord say? God's no respecter of persons. And then the Spirit of God spoke to me something real early, and that was that He said that God wants you to, to come into the fullness of Christ more than you want to. Yes. And that was important to me. Because I thought if my Father wants, wants it more than I do, then He's not holding back. Amen? He's not holding back. So it's just a matter of time as I press in that I will see the Lord and be able to walk in and and what they're walking in and more. And besides, I'm not I'm not working to attain unto the measure of the stature of so and so, but to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So so the comparisons drop out. I mean, you know, and Paul said that. Boy, I, you know, they're talking about people that compare it, and he said, Well, we have a measure that can reach even unto you. Remember, that? it's talking about Christ. <laughs> I love that. Well, we haven't had a measure that can even reach up to you, big boy. You know what I mean? <laughs> no matter how sharp you think you are, no matter how much you know, you ain't Jesus. You know, you're in the fullness. And so, you know, that's good because then when we look at him, and, and see, there's a difference too. You don't look at him in comparison of you. This is a big fault. Like, there's Jesus and there's me. That's separate. What happened to the cross? What happened to the resurrection? What happened to the Word of God? Well, I'm a Christian without the cross, the resurrection, and the Word of God. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, that's not safe. <laughs> you know? No. No, no, no. That's that's a problem when you're, when you're looking at Jesus and you're saying, well, you know, he's... Of course he can do it. He's the Son of God. Who do, they, who do you think you are? You're Son of God by Christ. You're joined. And so you don't look at him and then look at you and go, there's no way I could ever attain to that. No, no, no. You look at him and you go, he's the vine, I'm a branch, we're joined. All the root and fatness of the vine is mine, and I just want to open up right now. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm one. I'm abiding in the vine. Amen. And he doesn't go, no. <laughs> no, it's mine. You know, I'm the vine and you don't get any of it. No, 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 no. His whole desire for doing this was to fill you with all the fullness. That was his purpose. He already had it. He didn't come down here and get it. <laughs> He's always been all fullness. Amen. What he did was he came down here to share it. To fill us with all the fullness. And so... If you, um, which some of us were talking about this the other night, nobody that's in this room, and we were talking about this, and the scripture that says, uh, uh, one thing about desire, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. And I was just saying to them that to inquire in his temple, when you go in that temple, you're in a whole different realm. You left everything out there. You have left yeah. the old. Just like what we're talking about here, Paul was separated from his mother's womb. He entered into a whole new realm. He entered into the temple of the Lord to inquire in this temple. And you come in there and you start inquiring to God about things. He doesn't go, well, 
you know, yeah, life's tough on the job. When you inquire in the temple, he's not thinking about you on your job. He's thinking about the fullness of Christ, the finished work of the cross. He's thinking about that, all that is complete in him. He's thinking about that you have been, you, you've been the partaker of the divine nature. That he's, that's the view he sees in that temple. Why? Because to get in there, you already had to go through the altar. You already had to go through the labor. You already had to go through the showbread. You went through the candlestick. You went through the... And then, whoop, the veil is rent, and boom, you see him, and that's all there is now. David's tabernacle, there isn't a bunch of stuff, and it certainly isn't your life and your little tent on the edge of the camp. Amen. Well, I just came in here and I'm just wondering, uh, you know, um, should I, you know, pray tomorrow? What? Well, you know, I'm just trying to find out, if, or I was thinking about going to a movie. <laughs> you know, he's going. Pray, go to but I don't care. Just get in here and start inquiring as to what you are, who you are, and what the truth is. The truth, as it is in Jesus, that's what it says in Ephesians. Not just, well, the truth. No, no, it's just truths. It's just truths. A lot of truths. It's only one truth that'll make you free. You shall know the truth. And then he went on to say, for if you know the Son, then the Son will make you free. Well, that's right. That's right. So when you go into that temple, you are separated. See, and that's the problem, folks. We've never seen the separation. We've never seen the veil rent. We've never seen, we've never seen that we have entered into something that has cut away all of the first birth, all of the things that we have, all of the failures, all of the blessings, all of the talents, all of the reputation, all of the curses, all of the everything, you know. And we've entered into that which is, was, and will be. We've entered into life evermore, eternal life. But as long as we don't know that, as long as we don't view it that way, then what we do is we drag our old life, our old birth. We're not separated from our mother's room. We drag all of that in there, and we lay it all on that altar. And, uh, you know, and there is no real altar anymore in that sense. There's only the altar of incense that's before the thing, which it says in the book of Hebrews, that is actually on the inside. Now. You have to check that out. But the altar of incense is now not on the outside, but on the inside there because in reality there is no veil. And there is nothing but the thanksgiving and the joy of what is. But we don't know that. I mean, how are we going to know that? You know, I mean, imagine somebody standing up in front of you and telling you that and you're not seeing it. <laughs> Can you imagine such a thing? I mean, what would, what would the human mind be going through? I mean, could you imagine? Or could you tell me? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's got to be weird. It's got to be like, All right there, fella. Or, you know, or, uh, okay, yes, I will add that to one of my doctrines, pigeonhole number 527. And pull that out when I need it. Pull that out when you need it. My God, you've been separated from your mother's womb. You have a new birth. And, and it's <laughs> glorious. Now you see the kingdom of God. Now you enter into the kingdom of God. Now everything is different. What is true now is not what was. And if you never see that, you'll always wrestle with what was, and you'll also always try to drag that in to inquire in the temple pertaining to that, and God has no real ultimate answers for that other than the cross and glory to God, the resurrection. Amen. Another life will make you free. When the Son makes free, woo! we're talking free indeed. That's what the Scripture says. Whom the Son makes free is free indeed. Amen. You know? And so we, you know, and the good thing is we can shout that in church services across America. And people go, Whoa! Yeah, and walk right out and be in bondage. Yeah. And everybody in bondage. 
Nobody knowing that we're free indeed. Nobody separated from their from their mother's womb. Nobody uh, living by the new birth in that sense, but still relating to their life, themselves, and others based on their first birth. And what good is that? What good is it that we can shout and jump and carry on in a service about that and then live contrary to it? Does that bring glory to God? Answer is? No. 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 <laughs> no. It couldn't possibly. Well, it's got to because look, everybody's shouting. I mean, that shouting is everything. No. Faith is everything. <laughs> you know? And I'll tell you what, when you get this down on me in some, inside somebody, there's going to be joy, oh my goodness, unspeakable. In other words, can you imagine walking into a church service and somebody all of a sudden having the ability to share that and everybody just goes. <gasps> <laughs> and that, that's because they got it. It's unspeakable. You can go around, well, how do you put this into Thanksgiving or praise? Or, you know, I mean, it's like, thank you, Jesus. It sounds a little dorky, doesn't it? In light of the reality I just saw. You know? Yeah. Even, whoop, it is a little stupid. You know, like, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you break out of your tongue as much as close as it can go. Well, that's the closest thing I came to say, and that's it. That was it. I don't know, but I speak mysteries in the spirit. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Gosh. You know? But you see, that's something that has you instead of you having it. The truth has you instead of you having it. Because as long as you have it, I know you. You forget things. You lose things. Where did I, where did I put that truth? I'm free. I'm separated from my first birth. Where, where did I put that? I'm going to have it right here. You know, as long as you have it, we're in trouble. <laughs> it's going to get lost. But as long as it has you, man, oh man, now we're talking. Who busted that window back? <laughs> this takes me a while to catch up around here. You know. The truth will make you something. Amen? Amen? The truth makes you something. Now, let's believe that. If the truth makes you something, then you don't have to make yourself. You just have to be in proximity to the truth to lay hold of you. Huh? Paul said, I'm pressing toward the market for the hawk, high calling, that I may apprehend or lay hold of the thing that is laid hold of me. Yes. Something's gotten you, you can try to get away and everything else, and, you know, or you can try to get it or get away or anything else, and you can't. It's apprehended you. You might as well spend your time trying to apprehend what it's got, what's got hold of you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's frustration to try to run from it. A lack of frustration. I mean, the truth is the truth is the truth. Yes. So, Paul just begins with, please God who separated me from my first birth and call me by His grace. We could talk for hours on that. Mm -hmm. By His grace? There's nothing you can do to earn it. If you think that you can do something to keep it, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. It's yours. <laughs> but most Christians are actively doing things to maintain their grace. I don't want to go into that, but that's a, yeah. that's a pretty amazing fact, isn't it? They are actively doing things to maintain their grace. Oh, my. Let me tell you something. The longer you are in the Lord, the more you begin to realize, my God, this thing's my grace. Because <laughs> when you first start out, you think, oh, God, yeah, yeah, ooh, Ungawa. <laughs> uh huh. Uh -oh. We'll do this thing. Yes! Yes! You know, the further you get down the road, you go, just help me. <laughs> <laughs> I just believe in your grace. <laughs> you, know? you begin to realize, man, thank God this thing's by grace and always was. You know. And then he goes on to say, and here's the deal. He separated you from your first birth, 
called you by grace to reveal His Son in you, not to you. To reveal His Son in you. And if His Son is not being revealed in you, not just to you, I didn't say if, if you're not hearing good things and seeing good things in the Scriptures, I'm talking about being revealed in you, then you're missing the purpose for separation. The purpose for separation is to be separated not just from, but separated unto Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ revealed in you, Christ your life. Christ the only hope for glory that you have. The only hope. So he said to, set, to, pre, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Isn't that interesting? Most of us say he separated me from my mother's womb, called me by his grace that I might preach his son, his son among the heathen. We leave out one little phrase that is the main step between called or between saved, called, and that is. If the Son has not been revealed in you, you got no business preaching Him out to the nations. Amen. Because you're not preaching Him. You're preaching salvation by Him, but you're not preaching Him. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm on the mission field all the time. And I was telling somebody, oh, is it the guys gathering that I had the other night? Um, I, don't, I don't remember if I mentioned this to you guys, but you know, when I went to Cuba, um, we did, you know, several conferences. We were going quite a bit. We did several conferences and stuff and had to keep moving and everything like that. And now you've got to realize this place is closed to a whole lot of different things. And, and um, um, you come in there preaching Christ and Him crucified instead of, you know, miracles and, you know, all this kind of stuff. You don't know what you're going to get. We're going back in September. They invited us back. Of course, that's if we can get in. Not, you know, things have gotten worse even since I was there. If you didn't know that. Thank you. But they've invited us back. Now, I'm just going to tell you something. People don't invite you back if they don't want what you got. All right? If they don't think you got something for them, they're going to go, what was that? You know? When we went to Guatemala, they invited us back. You know how many times I've been to Nicaragua? Scheduled again. Everywhere we go preaching Christ and Him crucified, this is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. There's a new openness to Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because they've tried to fluff. You know, you can only eat meringue for so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you eat enough of it, you go, oh, I feel full. You know, because you're, you know, but it just goes, mm. you know? oh. I, I felt hungry for a second, dear, but now I'm empty. You know, you can only eat fluff for so long. It, doesn't, it, it, it makes you feel full, but it doesn't fill you. And the word filled meaning satisfy, truly satisfy. When I say satisfy, I'm not talking about your taste buds. I'm talking about your body needs. Yeah. I'm talking about satisfy your needs for, you know, whatever it is, the nutrition and the things that your body says, oh, yes, I'm satisfied. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The difference between your 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 taste buds going, mm, 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 I'm satisfied. <laughs> oh, no, okay. Give me more of that. Pa, 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 pa. You know, you know, I love pie, but I guarantee you, know, you know, after a while, your body, you know, your head's going to be screaming from sugar all the time. And and you know, your body's just going to do weird things, and, you know. <laughs> you know? Trust me, it's, it's great tasting, but it's not what God had in mind. He's got bread for the, for the hungry, and he's got meat for the for those that can be satisfied on meat, yes, he's got milk for the babes. Christ is all of those things. He's bread, he's meat, he's milk, he's all of that. But we must feed eventually on something more solid than that is Christ. And these, these places, everywhere we've been, have invited us back. They are hungry, hungry, hungry. And man, and I'm just going to finish with this part right here, but, but in Cuba, 
This is a ground floor, grassroots movement that has started on an island that is a completely separated country. They cannot get TBN in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just interesting that they can't get it. They, they can't get any of the American TV stations. It's all blocked out. They get Cuban stations. They get the Delta Castro going, Go on, I'm going to do what I say, when I say, or I'll kill you. <laughs> That's what they get. They don't get or they get in what we call they get into the Bible. And there, God has to talk to them or they get nothing. They don't have big tape ministries going on over there. They don't have big video ministries going on over there. Just the Word of God. So when so the Lord's starting to move in a grassroots movement in this little island, and some people come in, and they take the Word of God, and one after another, 45 minutes, shares, then sits down another one, 45 minutes, shares another one, for hours and hours and hours, and every one of them are going right down the Scriptures and saying, look what the Scriptures said, and look what the Scriptures said. They're just going, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, this book of Galatians ain't about getting blessed. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're just going, they don't have, they're like a clear chalkboard. You just write the, you know, they have the scriptures to back it up. But then when you say it, they go, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just going, yes. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God for communism. Thank God for all things and everything you think. Uh, yeah. All right, we're going to take a little break and we're still going to go